welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast, the Human Element Series. This is episode 137. Normally Chris would be your host, but this week it is me. I am Maxie Reynolds. I'm the technical team lead and attacker mindset expert at Social Engineer LLC. I'm currently a social engineer. My background is in oil and gas, stunts, um, acting and quantum computing of all things. <laughs> And that's it. You know, I think there's so much more to you, but we're going to let that go. We're going to just let that go. I don't think there's anything else. Let's roll on. Okay. We're going to, because people are probably curious why you introduced the podcast, but this isn't about me. It's not. This episode (laughs) is sponsored, though, by the company Maxie was just talking about, which is our company, Social Engineer LLC. We are a premier information security consulting and training company. We've been around since 2003. We specialize in understanding both the art and science of social engineering. So because of that, we focus on the human-based social engineering attacks. And that makes us able to provide education to organizations around the globe that can lead to their protection. We help through things like our services, phishing as a service, vishing as a service, social engineering risk assessments, and so much more. Actually, you can find out all the information about what we do on www.social-engineer.com. Okay. Hi. Hello, Christopher Hadnagy. Welcome to yes. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. How does it feel to have the shoe on the other hand? It's awkward. <laughs> if my team did not force me to do this, I would not be here right now because this feels weird. You know what? It will be painless. I am <laughs> going to <laughs> make sure this is the easiest interview you ever have in your whole day to day (laughs) day to day that's great (laughs) no but really it's a really exciting reason that we are doing this right you have a new book coming out it's your fifth book your fifth book i think you should that's a little weird to hear that out loud round of applause for that i think it's really cool that's amazing there's a lot of work goes into a book yeah so Let's dive in to the only point that I really think we can start because I've read this book and it covers a lot of areas. It has a lot of breadth and depth. I think we could talk about it for days and still not exhaust all of the topics and things that you cover and the places that you really actually can help people within this book. So I'm just going to start in the only logical place I can. The book is called Human Hacking, Win Friends, Influence People and Leave Them Better Off for Having Met You. Will you break down that title for us and just tell me Mm. each of the parts, how they fit together, and I suppose how this book fits? Yeah, that's a big starting point. So I'm going to grab my copy and hold it while I talk about it because then I can answer your question intelligently. (laughs) So let's see. Let me break it down first. How did it come about? Let me Mm -hmm. start with that because then the title will make a little more sense. Okay. When I started teaching social engineering skills in my class, I thought it would be just for pen testers, that this would be the only way that I would use it because that's what I was and that's what I was using social engineering for. Okay. About three or four years into teaching, I started to see that 20%, 30%, and 40 and 50% of my classes were nothing to do with InfoSec. Mm-hmm. They were stay-at-home parents. They were salespeople, magicians, psychologists, just enthusiasts. I couldn't understand why. And I kept asking each person that would come, why are you here? And they would say, oh, I had a friend that took this class and said it was amazing. I would always stay in touch with these students. You know, we start a Slack channel and then we stay in touch with the students through email and that medium. And I would ask how they're using the skills in their life. And more and more, I started to see that people were using the things I taught in class, not as part of InfoSec, but just part of every day. And when we started this company and I had a chance to write that course, I had the privilege of working with Robin Dreek. And one of his mottos was the leave them feeling better for having met you. Mm -hmm. So we adopted that here in the company and I kind of made that our whole mantra. So the title of the book, right? First, the human hacking. To me, it's more than just InfoSec. It's more about hacking ourselves. Like, you know, you see all these things like food hacks and other things like that, where you can make something, do something that it's not supposed to do. Yes. So as humans, we need to learn how to alter our thinking and our frame. So that's the first part of the book, the main title, right? Human hacking. But then to do what? Well, the list is that it's win friends, influence people, which influence versus manipulation is a big part of the book mm-hmm. and always have the goal of leaving them feeling better for having met you. 
So it's okay. really like accomplishing your goals in life, but doing it in a positive way and not thinking that to hack humans that you need to always be malicious or bad or dark. As of course, that's like to it. And that's an escapable. That's a big word for me. <laughs> <laughs> but in the book, you've definitely found a way to bring out the best side of what we do, because what we do can be dishonest. Just we as social engineers, and then mm -hmm. as humans, there's pro-social lying, there's influence, there's manipulation. So you've definitely found a way within that to bring I bet the best out in it for people. Thank you. Not at all. There is one line in the book that I really loved, and it was when you talked about basically a sort of martial art for the mind. If you remember that line, that would that stuck with me. And even when I read it a second time, which yes, I've read it a second time, <laughs> that line really stuck out for me because as humans, there's a sort of duality, right? There's you hear your thoughts at the same time as you're thinking them. Mm -hmm. You're not always just this one dynamic rolling thing. And your book kind of picks that apart a little bit, it takes the best of humanity, the best of thinking and thoughts and applies it to something good. And that our company model really does stand out in the book. Do you think that this book could be used to go the opposite direction? Do you think that that is possible with this book? Yeah, I think it's kind of like any tool that's made. You know, you yeah. have a company that makes these beautiful knives that are for chefs. Yeah. And somebody can buy it and, and murder somebody with it. Right. And that's not yeah. the intended purpose. So the very first pages of this book, and I know it's silly, but we did it anyway, because it's a contract that yeah. I'm hoping people will read and sign that in your mind will commit you to using these skills positively. Because once you learn how to do these things, yeah, using them for selfish gain is easy. You can go out and pick up people that you're interested in sexually and manipulate them using these mm -hmm. skills. You can get people to part with you know, money or goods using these skills. You can get upgrades on things that may make someone else less comfortable. You can get things you want while hurting someone else's chance at keeping their employment. You can do all of that, but that would then break that last piece, which is the leaving them feeling better for having met you. And it yeah. also breaks the core principle of the book. I really don't want to say it this way, but I'm going to anyway. Like I'm, I could boil this book down into like one page about <laughs> <Yeah>. empathy. <laughs> And that's really okay. what it is about empathy. It's like it's learning how to do the things that you need to do to get what you want while always remaining empathetic. And that's really, really hard. So I think the answer to your question is you can go the opposite way because that's easy. It's easy yes. to be negative and manipulative. It's hard to get what you want and remain empathetic. So, yes, first of all, I've loved your, um, your analogy with the knives. I come from Scotland where we've sold about 4 million baseball bats, but not a single ball. <laughs> so <laughs> I, uh, That's a I'm, great example. I'm, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So do you think then, reductively, this comes down to empathy? But empathy, I believe, and I'm interested to hear if you do, lives on a spectrum. You can be an empath all the way back to no empathy at all. Does this book, will this book help people learn what empathy is? Well, that's a great question. That's my hope. Okay. What I hope to accomplish with it is by through example of both successes and failures on my part mm -hmm. and the lessons I learned from both of them, showing how when things were done empathetically, it always worked out better to my advantage and the other person. And I'm hoping that by that type of lessons that it will get across that empathy you know we end the book with empathy rocks it does and it, it's the yeah. it's the it's the core of of making uh, great relationships and being a great communicator so i'm hoping that comes across where does empathy fit with amygdala hijacking so mm -hmm. if you and i now you're my boss and I often, mainly, sometimes there are times when I do what you tell me. <laughs> when there are times. There's there a few. Are, <laughs> there are genuinely mistakes. <laughs> there are coincidences. When we are sort of, let's say, a standoff, and I use that term lightly because I don't mean it to sound as harsh as it does. And you need to come in to talk to me. You want to leave me feeling better for having met you in that moment. Is it a conscious decision? to employ empathy in that moment, especially if you are hijacked by a Oh, heck yeah. It, it has is. to be. 
Okay. I mean, for me, especially my standard communication profile is direct. And, you know, I think it's a fair statement to say that with every good relationship, you're going to have standoffs as you put them once in a while. You're going to have times where you disagree on the path that should be taken. And sure, it's easy to go, hey, I'm the boss, just obey and shut yeah. up. Mm -hmm. And that may get compliance, but it's not going to get team. It's not going to get camaraderie. It's not going to get understanding, right? Which is loyalty and understanding are way more important than just obedience and compliance, right? Eventually, if you look at this from forgetting about employee for a second, but your children, mm -hmm. I want my kids to grow up and be responsible members of society, not just obedient kids. Yes. Because if all they know is obedient, what happens the day I'm not around? then they don't know what to do. And then they're like that spring that just pops around everywhere, mm -hmm. right? That's released too fast. So for me, it's a conscious decision. And I know that, you know, we've joked about this before on our Instagram live thing, but you and I got into a argument. I mean, well, yes. we get into arguments all the time, but <laughs> one of our first ones, and it was a conscious decision for me to say, oh, wow, this is going really poorly. I need to adjust my communication method. And in doing that, we were able to fix it and joke about it now. Yes. Yes. But we that have was a do. conscious decision. <laughs> yeah. That was a conscious thing for me to say, I need to change this because we're going to end up just punching each other in the face for no reason whatsoever. Oh yeah. One for one straight after that. Yeah. There would be yeah. no question. And we'd still yeah. be doing it now. Yeah. Yeah. We would be on this podcast <laughs> arguing about who was right yeah. in that moment. <laughs> was, yeah. Of course but it was me. But, you do you... <laughs> <laughs> so I want to just go on this sort of empathy line just a little bit longer because if it's one of the core principles of the book, I think it begs discussion. Yeah. For me, I've always understood empathy to be you putting yourself in someone else's shoes. That's the way it was explained to me when I was younger. My mum didn't think I had a lot of <laughs> empathy. That's a different podcast. <laughs> but is that the same for you? Do you sit and look at it from someone else's point of view to sort of employ that empathy to bring it up to the surface or do you do that differently? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question, Max. So there's more to it than that because okay. let's think of this in the sense of you and me. Mm -hmm. If I'm trying to empathize with you and you're having a problem with your mom, right? So yeah. you're having a problem with your mom. I may not be able to truly fully empathize because A, I'm not a female mm -hmm. and I don't have the same relationship with my mom that you have with yours. Yeah. So I can't just sit there and go, well, how would I feel if I'm Maxi? That, yeah. That's not enough to just say I then empathize because I may not be able to fully do that. So it's actually putting myself in your emotional state. You know, so like not to throw you under the bus, but I'm going to use this example because I think this was great. We were in a big team meeting once discussing something important. You said, I got to go and you hung up and left, which was really odd. Yes. And you just left. And at first I'm like, what the heck? We're in a team meeting. She like people just can't leave without explaining. Found out your dad had went into a coma. Yeah. Well, at that point, this is not the time to talk to you about proper business etiquette, etiquette leaving <laughs> yeah. a meeting. I've never had that situation. So empathy for me goes, oh, my gosh, she must be so sad, so upset, so distraught. So forget all of the business rules. What can we do to support you? What can we do to help you? That to me is more about empathy is trying to understand what you may have been feeling at that time. So that way I can react appropriately. So let me try to sum up what you've said in two distinct khakis here. There's one which is essentially you're saying it's a point in time assessment of someone else's emotional state. Yes. And the second half of that is that you look to someone's emotional state react on it and it becomes hierarchical almost as if your business probably isn't as important to you as your family your business cannot be as important to me as my family i would agree with that so does empathy have a sort of hierarchical duty yes or to work within i love that but man you got some great questions this is a good one so if you think about it when you ask that question the first thing that came to my mind is if i was walking down the road with amaya mm -hmm. that's my daughter for anyone who may not know and i saw a car coming the opposite direction skipping a curb looked like a drunk driver that was about to run into her and we're walking yeah i may take her and literally throw her out yeah. of the way and harm her in doing so so i may say you know, the empathetic thing would be, hey, honey, there's a car coming that may kill us in a second. We should move. Yeah. But I may ignore that hierarchy of that discussion to say I need to save her life. Yeah. So at times you make decisions 
that don't always equate with the way that you would handle it in a different emotional state. Okay, understood. Right? So back to the example with you, if you had just said, oh, my Chinese order's at the door, I'm leaving the team meeting, then the discussion would have been much different. I've been like, well, Max, you know, you knew we had a meeting. It was on the calendar. Why did you yeah. schedule delivery for then? Or, you know, maybe just pause, don't leave. You know, there would have yeah. been a different discussion as opposed to, oh, my dad is in a coma. My mom just called me frantic. You don't need to explain to us what's happening at that moment. I do not. Right. right. So I think it's balancing the emotional state of the person with the immediate needs and not of you, but of the situation. Yes. And then you assess that and that should hopefully alter your response to the proper degree of emotion. And then to kind of bring it back to your original question, mm. since we're all human, yes, we're going to be affected by our own emotions and our own amygdala hijacking and our own emotional state will affect that, right? So that will take conscious effort because in the previous, previous, previous example of when you and I argued, mm -hmm. I was angry. Yeah. I was angry. So I had to say, oh, I need to stop yeah. and I need to calm down. And I had to physically tell myself, why are you angry? This is stupid. You need to be over it. And then I was able to move past that situation. But that took a literal physical thought to say, I need to stop the path that I'm on. What is very interesting about the example you were just talking about, again, you and I got in a fight. It was a legitimate fight towards the end of my day a long time ago. And I remember being very <laughs> frustrated, very angry at you and thinking like, no, 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 this is not the way it should be. And I dig my heels into the, I could drill for oil. My heels go that far into the ground soon. Yeah. Sometimes. But I remember feeling that I can still sort of take myself back to that emotional response that I had. And when you came in and you said to me in an email, you know, Max, I think we should start again here. And whatever you said, all the, there was a subtext of apology. It all disappeared instantly for me. And I find that really interesting in hindsight. In the moment, I did not find it interesting. Yeah. I thought to myself, I should have done that first. Was my actual <laughs> response. <laughs> but in hindsight, it's really interesting because you essentially, I think, re hijacked my amygdala. It was hijacked once, probably of my own accord, when I decided to become angry at you in that call that then turned into 1,000 emails. Yes. <laughs> but then after, when you come and you said, hey, Max, we're going to start again. It cleared for me and it was instant. And that is very interesting. As humans, the effect we have on other humans with yeah. words, with one line of essentially, I am sorry. Yeah. It's interesting. I find that interesting too, because I think when we get involved in trying to understand somebody else's emotions, mm -hmm. it can affect us. If we allow it, it can affect us very deeply. And I think if we try to understand why somebody may take a certain action, mm -hmm. then it can also help explain something that we may not even agree with. Like, why would somebody go and do this? And now, there are some things that, you know, even understanding them doesn't make it right. Someone being harassing or being prejudiced or being overly rude or sexist, understanding why someone may do that doesn't make it easier to handle or make it right. But understanding why someone does that may help us to understand if this is a personality flaw or were they raised this way? Yeah. You know, were are people this way because their parents taught them this? You know, were they treated poorly as a child and now they're this way? So there's so many things that when we understand where someone comes from, it may help explain why they are this way. And then it makes it less irritating is when we don't understand that we internalize it and we make it all about ourselves. And we say, why are you doing this to me? I don't understand this. Why are you this way to me? Yes. So that I can get on board with for the most part. But there's something else we do as humans, which is a little more narrow and a little sort of short sighted. We have short memories, so to speak. I could hear that, let's say, Chris was raised this way and so he reacts this way to me. And that's why he trips at me every day, forever. Whatever it was that By you way, did. None that of that's I, true. None, none of, of that's that true, true, people. <laughs> <laughs> but if it was, and I was to still understand the root cause of it, eventually I would say, and I have, you know, you hear people say, yes, but they're old enough to know now. They're old enough yes. to learn now. So yep. how do you strike that balance? How should we strike that? Yeah. So that's why I said that 
there are some actions that don't get excused because of understanding. Okay. But the understanding may help you yeah. decide how much of it you want to handle. Okay. Right. So let's not use either of us as an example. Let's say that mm -hmm. we had an employee here, which we don't. But let's say we had an employee here that came into work every day drunk and it was affecting their ability to do the work properly. Yeah. So we talk with them, we talk with them, we find out that they were abused as a kid and mm -hmm. this is the way they handle their emotions. It's not right. It's not proper. It's affecting their life and we feel horrible for them. That doesn't mean we just say, okay, you can stay employed here forever. It doesn't matter. You can come in drunk because we have empathy for you. There's still possibility they're going to damage our company and our clients. So you know, we may have to relieve that person of their job here. Mm -hmm. But now when we do it, we may say, look, you know, we can't have you anymore, but can we help you get into rehab? Yeah. Can we help find you a path that may help you with your health? Can we recommend a good therapist to you? Right. So, so our answer might be different than let's say his answer was this, you know, fake employee was, well, I'm young and I want to go out and party every night. So I'm getting drunk for fun. Now our answer may be completely different. It's like, well, your choice to go out and do drugs and party every night is affecting your work performance. You're fired. Yes. Right. So understanding the reasons we may not excuse it. So the balance is, I think each individual has to decide what can you handle? What can you handle and what can you not? And what does that understanding now do for you in reference to allowing or not allowing that in your life? Got it. Okay, perfect. I like that. It's an interesting way to look at it and probably helpful to a few people. I found that a little, I hope. quite helpful there. So switching gears a little bit with getting back to the book, there are a lot of stories in the book. Yeah. <laughs> I know you like to sort of release information from your magnificent mind to the world via story. I think you do enjoy that way of I educating do. people. In the book, my selfish question is, the stories that you've told, how accurate are they to the way they unfolded in real life? Oh, that's a great question. So, you know, the only way I can answer that is what I believe to be true, which is mm -hmm. I told the stories as they happened in my memory. Okay. So if they're not right, I'll need somebody to tell me like, well, that's not the way it happened. But those stories, like the opening story in the book. Yeah. So <laughs> this one is always great to me. So when I worked with Seth, and we'll talk about him later, when I worked with Seth, I told this story and then he painted pictures that made it like a Hollywood movie. He did. You know, <laughs> as he painted it, I said, but actually that was really accurate because we were in a desert area. And we were driving and we kept hitting these potholes because we weren't on a road. We yeah. were driving literally through the desert. And then we would see an animal you know, run in front of us. And, and he's like, well, what kind of animals are out there? I'm like rabbits and coyotes and stuff. And he's like, yeah. I don't know what it was because we had our lights off and we just had parking lights on. So, And there was all this weird brush blowing. And he painted it like it's this old haunted Western or something, you know. And yeah. when I read it, I'm like, wow, you actually captured the feeling of that event in a way that I don't think I would have captured it unless I could have verbally told the story. Okay. So that one in particular, like I always like, man, this is so great. Like you got it. And then there was a couple times where in telling a story that he wrote it and I had to go back and go, well, that actually didn't happen what you wrote there. Oh, like at one point. Yeah. He said in that first story in the first version, he said, oh, and then we pulled out this big black blanket to cover the SUV so no one can see it. I'm yeah. like, we didn't do that. And we never did that. So you got to take that out. And he's like, yeah, you know, I forget. He's like, but, it, you know, it's like a little bit of, and I'm like, nah, nah, we, like, it didn't happen. So you have to <laughs> take it out because someone like Ryan was with me. He's going to read this. And he was like, wait, dude, that didn't happen, you know. Yeah. And so you know, I, I want it to be as accurate as possible. All right. Interesting, because there are some brilliant stories in that book, without giving away for those who will want to read this. So writing with someone, is it akin to sort of paint by colours? Do you fill in the sort of stencil picture and they just give it some colour in places? If you get the right, I think they're called ghost writers, but yeah. the reason that he is different than a ghost writer, and I'll tell this story, is that I convinced him, I social engineered him into putting his name on the book. So and <laughs> he, he's been doing this 17 years and he's never put his name on a book. And this was the first time. And it just took me a year. <laughs> so, it took um, you a year. A year. Go a year. On. <laughs> I planted the seed in the very beginning when I realized how awesome he was. 
So, you know, you already mentioned, this is my fifth book. So my first four books, if you read them, you really get the sense that it's me. You know, there's not big words. You know, you I sound like a moron sometimes, you, you know. Not, I, but yes. But you can hear me in it. They're drier and, and they're very deep. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So they're a little more direct and they definitely are more on the technical side. And the way you write with a ghostwriter is, you know, you have your outline of your chapters and then you get together either we elect it better in person, but sometimes it had to be over a call because of COVID. And you tell stories about that chapter. So he would say, make believe you're going to teach me. So when we get to like, let's just say disc is our first chapter. Right? Teach yeah. me about disc. So I do a two, three, four hour conversation with him teaching about disc. And he asks questions upon questions upon questions, drilling into every little nitty gritty. And then I think of a story and I tell the story. He records it. He takes that recording. He pays someone to have it transcribed. He takes that transcription and he writes the chapter. Oh, wow. Out of that. Yes. Then I read it and I come back with him and I go, okay, well, wait, this fact is wrong or wait, no, that science doesn't make sense or this yeah. or that. And then I send him PDFs of scientific studies that I want included in the book that prove the points of what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. He has a group of people that read those studies to make sure that I'm not full of crap, you know, so he like they read it and they go, I'm confused how this applies to that. And then we have a discussion and then that chapter's done and we move on to the second chapter. So how long was this entire process? Oh, boy. From the time that we started to January 5th, when it's released, yeah. it would be almost two years, a year and oh, wow. a year and three quarters. So I want to go down a couple of cul-de-sacs, actually. But first, this is very different to your other four books, right? You've said Way that. Way different. It's completely different. It's almost yeah. night and day. Yeah. Now for this book, how did it come to be? Aside from what we talked about at the start, how would this book different? How did it come to be? Now? Yeah. So this has been plaguing me for like the last year or two that I've seen all these people come to my class. Mm -hmm. And then I would have people email me and say, you know, one of my friends took it. I really want to take it, but I can't afford, you know, $3,500. Is there any way that you have student discounts or things like that? Yeah. Sometimes I would then, you know, Thanks. I'm putting this out there, but I'm not in charge of this anymore. So don't email yeah. me because <laughs> I gave away too many seats, but and then yeah. my team would get mad at me, but I would get weak and I would say, yeah, just give me like a couple hundred bucks to cover the materials and you can come. And I would do that all the time because I always felt <laughs> I wanted people to have this education. So one of my personal heroes and a mentor of mine is Joe Navarro. Yes. And I was talking to Joe one day about this, this story, this concept that you and I are talking about here. And I was saying, I really want this to be out there. I want this to be more than just my class, which a lot of people can't afford. And he said, you know, Chris, I'm going to put you in touch with my agent. Yeah. And but he said, like, you know, play it cool because he doesn't advertise. He doesn't take on new people. Okay. You know, you have to be referred. It's like the 1920 speakeasy, you know, like you have to knock <laughs> on the door and say the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> and he may just come out and tell you this is a crappy idea and it will never sell. And he said, you should trust him because he's been in the industry. He, like, he helped create the industry. He's trained so many people that are at major publishers doing this. And now he's an agent selling those books. And I'm like, okay. So he introduced me to Steve Ross from New York, definite New Yorker. You can hear it in his voice, the way he talks, the whole nine yards. And I lay the concept out for Steve. And Steve was just going through some personal struggles at the time. And our communication was gapping. Like he would go away and I wouldn't hear from him for like two or three weeks. And I thought, oh, he just doesn't like the idea. Yeah. So one day I sent him an email and he had sent me back this long explanation about some personal things that were happening in his life that were really bad. Mm -hmm. And I just sent him back to see like, I'm so sorry about this. And I sent him some encouragement and some things. And he was like, oh, this is everything you just said that you want to do in your book, isn't it? And I'm like, no, I wasn't doing anything. I just was trying to be <laughs> empathetic, you know? Yes. And he's like, okay, you know, let's talk. And then he took the idea and he was like, this, this is revolutionary. And I'm like, well, it's not really revolutionary. He's like, no, it is. <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> I'm like, it's really not. And he's like, it is. He goes, a hacker has never written a book like this. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, this is the 21st century edition of win friends and influence people, you know, stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, really? And he's like, it is. So we went and we interviewed a bunch of writers. So that's the first stage of it. We interview okay. a bunch of writers. And unbelievably, he said to me, I have three. The top two will probably say no because they're so busy and they're so high qualified and they write all the best books that are out there today, all the New York Times bestsellers. 
they both said yes. Okay. And I'm like, well, now this is a problem. And he's like, this is a problem. He's like, <laughs> he's like now you have to choose who you want to work with. And I resonated mm-hmm. with Seth. I okay. really did. When I met Seth and we talked, like he got it right away. Yeah. And he was excited about it, the concept. And he started talking mm-hmm. about, oh man, when we're done with this one, I can think of it. And I was like, whoa, whoa, like you're way excited. And he's not an I at all. And I'm like, this is great. So we started that process and then writing a proposal. That's the first mm-hmm. stage of doing this, which I never knew because my first four books were tech books and we didn't do that. And then Steve took it and he created an auction, believe it or not, to all the main publishers. Really? Okay. And he gave them a time slot to go and do this and bids started coming in and Harper Collins won it. That's now, a journey. Here we are. Seth has done a really good job. This book reads really well and it reads in a way that is easily translatable to those who are not in the art industry. Whereas your other four books, they have a certain amount of that quality, but you would still have to be interested in the core yeah. principles of the book and the core, yeah. Yeah, the whole book. Whereas this one, it can resonate. If you're a human, you should be able to yes. read this book and yes. enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> that was the goal. That was the goal. And Seth did it. It was really interesting. And um, when you were talking there, you touched on COVID, which is a highly charged topic and a difficult one for a lot of people, no matter what side you're on. In the book, you do say these are difficult times in which to live as a human being. Technology has rendered us more isolated from one another and more socially awkward than ever before. I think COVID has accelerated some, you know, of the harder parts of those issues that we have. Can this book solve them in any way? Can it help? Okay, I'm going to say it can help. Okay. I'm reluctant to say solve because that's a big task. I think any knowledge, so whatever, the, let's take it out of this book for a second. Any knowledge mm-hmm. that anyone can ever learn, mm-hmm. the change only happens if the person applies that knowledge. Right. So knowledge is basically just information. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So if you want to become wise, you have to apply the knowledge that you learn. So -hmm. someone can read this book, put it down, go away and do nothing. And it's not going to fix anything. But when I look at the world situation we're in now, where we're so isolated, when you started working for me, we didn't force video meetings all the time. No. And then I realized that reading articles about the increase in depression in this country And a lot of it being related to that many people just don't have friends and family that they're chatting with often. I said, we need to see each other's faces. So I started instituting that every meeting should be a video meeting. And I'm not sure if it's helping or not, but I feel like it is for me, at least. I feel like seeing my team, I look forward to those days. I look forward to the times throughout the day where I'm going to get in the call with you and Ryan, and I'm going to, we're going to laugh and chat and, you know, whatever. And it makes it more human. So I think part of this book is teaching people how to make those connections, whether you're virtual, digital, in person or not. So I think two things that you often say that, and I subscribe to them as beliefs, is one, that humans love stories, Mm. and two, we do need connection, right? We are born for it. This book does have that quality. It is full of stories, and so they are easily translatable. And I know I've said that before, but they do sort of bring that with them. They really take your knowledge, the knowledge that you have, and they make it very easy for us to just learn. And of course, there is the connection part, which is one of the most difficult things to solve for, because loneliness is like a silent killer, really. It takes yeah. years off of life. That's not some like weird Scottish old... No, that's real. That's that's science. Tale, that's, yeah, it's proven. Did you know, or were, are you aware, that reading is actually one way to feel connected? The same as when people put on their television. It's less so than you and I being on a video call, but it shaves off the edges of loneliness. And, and this book does help that. And if you do apply the things after, I do think you will be better off for having yeah. read it. <laughs> so I've butchered your... <laughs> hey, no, that's okay. Model, I like it. But, yeah. I like it. I'm hoping, right? Of course, the hope, and I think when you've ever put your work out, is that when people read it, that they enjoy it, that they find some benefit from it. You know, and it's not, for me, it's not about like getting great reviews, although that always feels good. Yeah. But it's more about, did this help people? Did they read it and go, yeah, wow, this actually altered my life. So you're not going to like this one. I'm so sorry to do this to you. (laughs) 
how would you like people to let you know that that if it, oh. if it helps them? Yeah, no, that's okay. Actually, I don't mind that one. So they can leave an Amazon review. When my book first comes out, I try my hardest to get in there and reply to people. Mm -hmm. Also on the website, thehumanhackingbook.com, okay. there's a contact yeah. form that people can go on there and put, you know, they can put comments and send something in. My Twitter is human hacker. They can okay. go on there and yell at me and tell me what a <laughs> moron I am or whatever, you know. <laughs> I'll do that. I'm pretty open on LinkedIn and other places like that to communicate with people. And you're happy to sort of reply to people. I am. Yeah. When possible. That's nice. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I am. You know, so far since the books come out, I've been getting hit up on LinkedIn a lot from folks asking like, will you talk to me about it? Or will you do an interview? Or yeah. I've had a yeah. bunch of people asking questions about it. And I try my hardest to answer as many as I can. You know, we get busy. We so do. <laughs> it depends on, you know, how much time I have to respond to them. But mm -hmm. I really appreciate when people also have like things that I can do to improve. So, you know, if they come to me and say like, hey, this was great, but I wish this, this or this, that just makes me better for the next time. So I like that, you know, I don't like being insulted, but I do like <laughs> improvement points, you know. I'll rain back on the insults, but. Uh... <laughs> well, for you, I expect it, but you yeah. Know. <laughs> How do you know I love you? That's the only, <laughs> the only tell I mean. <laughs> okay, so there are two things. One, in summation almost, of a few of your last points. This book is essentially APSC in narrative. Right. There is it's it takes a lot of what we teach at APSC and it applies it to masses. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. So yeah, APSC being the advanced practical social engineering course. Yeah. And what this book does is it takes it out of the realm of info security completely okay. and just takes those lessons into everyday life. So instead of like, you know, we send students out to go get a name and date of birth, instead of doing that, we're saying, hey, use these skills to find out why your daughter is not enjoying school anymore or to find out why your employee's quality of work has gone down, right? Use these skills to figure out your relationships more, to improve those relationships and communicate better. Interesting. Okay. And there are homework, like assignments in the book, yeah. right? Where people can yeah. try some of these things. Yeah. And I really, really want people to come back that's what I want. And tell me. <laughs> yes, I want I do. them marked. Yeah, I, <laughs> I want to know. I want to know. I want people to come back. And I'm thinking of putting on the Human Hacking Book website an area where people can go and like, tell me, like, did they do this? You know, did they go and do this homework assignment? How was it? You should. You know, one of the things I often say to you and you shrug off is that you are generally ahead of the curve. That's why I have a job, I think, within <laughs> this industry, because I tried to start a company to match yours only to figure <laughs> out, okay, I cannot catch up. But if you do that on the site, I think that would be very interactive. Yeah, I know. We've been talking about it and, you know, well, check the site out, humanhackingbook.com. Maybe by the time this comes out, comes it will out. be there. Yeah. I don't know. I, <laughs> you know. I have all these things in there where I say, hey, go do this and, you know, let me know how it works. And I'm like, man, I really do want to know. Yeah. <laughs> I really do want to know. I, I want to know how people are getting along, you know, and we have this public Slack channel now for social mm -hmm. engineering. I was also thinking of adding a section in there for just the book yeah, to have people that read should. it come in and discuss it, you know, and I'm active in that Slack channel often. So I try, you know, it's like, like anything. I mean, now between the company and, you know, ILF, and mm -hmm. I just became a professor of social engineering. Yes, you and did. This book, <gasps> it's like I'm, there's so many things happening, you know, that it's yes. kind of a little ridiculous. But I missed a trick not introducing you as Professor Pat Nagy. Although I'd I'm like to see glad you didn't think week. of that. <laughs> um, glad you didn't think of that. I have one last question before we sort of leave the contrast of APSC and the book alone. Which was harder to write, the course or the book? which was harder Ooh. to find wisdom and waste in, well, to have the wisdom and find waste in part. So I'm going to say the course was harder to write and mainly be a personal thing because when mm -hmm. I wrote the course, A, there was nothing in the world about social engineering. Okay. So I was kind of creating something from scratch yeah. and I had much, much less experience applying it in life. Okay. So now jump forward 11 years and writing this book and having the stories to back it up just yeah. seemed natural to me because okay. it was not only because you know when I go and I figure something out for social engineering, I do try it at home. 
You know, yeah. I, Maya was little and Colin was little. I used to use reflective questioning on them all the time until they figured out how to combat me on it. I've used proper influence to get my kids and family to like want to, you know, eat the food I want or go on those places I want to go. And it may be long, long pond, you know, like spending time, like showing them a picture of Italy six months before I bring up the idea about that, you know, buying only Italian wine at home and cooking more Italian food and, you know, things like that. You know, and then eventually go, hey, you know what? We should visit that place. And then everyone's more compliant. I believe to do that. that is called the mere exposure effect. And it is <laughs> a brilliant, brilliant I've strategy. <laughs> and I've been doing this for like now 11 years, you know, practicing yeah. these things. So the book has stories of like how you can get compliance from people that are close to you without manipulating them, right? Because at the end of the day, the things that I get my family to do are also are fun and good for them. I'm not yeah. convincing them to do something that's going to harm them or, yeah. you know, go jump off a building or do something dangerous. It's or more to every clutch show, not to mine. I mean, that is the best thing that my family, I mean, think about this. They have a father and a mm -hmm. husband that has introduced them to the world's best music. It is the music of this podcast. It is the music of APSE. <laughs> Your soundtrack. Yes. It's the soundtrack to my life. I agree with that. The I mean, and now eggs. the world will know about Clutch because I write about Neil in my book. You do. Is yeah. that okay? Can, I, I you, mentioned him a couple times. So, what, What's your favorite mention of our illustrious Neil? Well, you know, I think to me, it's, there's a couple of things. So in the thanks, the acknowledgements, mm -hmm. because of what he's done for the ILF, he's a tremendous force for good. He really you is. Know? And then for me personally, just getting him to read the book and then inside, let me see, where is it? Where is it? There's this page that says more praise for human hacking. And I have this beautiful oh, quote, yeah. right? Go human it. hacking is not about deception. It's about honesty. And the simple practice of honesty can be applied to any situation, anywhere, by anyone for the betterment of all. Neil Fallon, lead singer of Clutch. I mean, come <laughs> on. I get goosebumps reading that. Yeah, but that man's like a poet. He, he is. He's a lyrical he's genius. A poet. He really is. He is a lyrical this genius. Is, I should not have brought Clutch up. I don't know why. I think this is derailed now. I'll never get you back. <laughs> we Neil, are going Neil, to switch Neil, gears. Neil. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Try to Neil. Fallon, Fallon, Fallon. <laughs> anyway, let's return to the topic <laughs> at hand. Clutch. No. <laughs> I meant um, my book. Yes. Forgot about that. Yes. How could we socially engineer Clutch to, I don't know, come work with us? Well, well, Matt, we should put a Clutch show on outside of one of our next clients. The next break we do, our... have like a Clutch impromptu show. Get everybody you know, outside. I actually talked to them about that. I wanted them to play a human hacking conference, but they don't play conferences. Oh. Oh. So what we did decide, though, is that I can work with their agent to have a live show in a city that we could sell, and it would just may coincide with our conference, and then the conference may include a ticket to the show. I have a different possibility for you here, a different potential solution. But let's call it like <laughs> HHP, Human Hacking Party, because I bet they play parties. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, they're kind of a big band. You know, they play like OzFest and... Not fast and things like that. HHF, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, done. We'll see you in 2021 for Clutch. 2022. 2021 is, remember, virtual. They can do it virtually. Can they? Doesn't they matter. can. Yeah, they're doing a show. Look, this this is devolved because I brought yes, up Clutch. You did. Once. You ruined it. I'm going to go on a whole different route. What if we do some sort of quick fire questions where I ask the question quickly, but you probably talk Answer a little quickly. longer, but you oh. won't. So. <laughs> What's I, your I favorite can... story? You won't. Don't try. Don't do my it. My favorite story. In the book, yeah. My favorite story is the one about Amaya noticing the woman on the side of the road who was showing extreme sadness and forcing me to turn around, stop, and then her going and comforting. Because for me, that story has a few different pieces of information that make it the best for me. Mm -hmm. First, as a dad, seeing your kids make application to things that you've taught them and show that level of empathy. I don't know if any dad can be prouder. Like that's just the best thing ever. Yeah. And then seeing that that one thing can have an effect on her life, the way that she acts for the rest of her life. 
mm-hmm. is also a big thing. And then that we left someone, a total stranger, we left them just feeling better for that moment. Yeah. That kind of, to me, signifies everything that this book is about. So to okay. me, that's my favorite story. Interesting. Sort of diving into that a little bit. Do you think that there's a stage in adolescence where we as humans have or display less empathy? Oh, yeah. I ask? With teenagers. Yeah. Okay. So you do feel that because there are stages and I think the younger they are within just the adolescent period, not as children, children display great amounts of empathy. Yeah. But children are also uh, selfish in the sense of when I want food or when I want sleep or when I want comfort, I'm Mm going to cry until you give it to me, right? But they're taught empathy from their parents or taught compassion. Mm -hmm. But children also don't, like let's say toddlers and children don't, they're colorblind, they're gender blind, they don't care who you are, they'll comfort you. Then we hit teenage stage and there is a moment where we're figuring out our life, what we're going to do. And there's a lot of self-awareness as well as self-esteem issues yeah. and men being self-absorbed, right? What I want is the most important thing in the world. I don't think I agree with that, but yes. Do you think that reading this book as a teenager would have helped you, Mm. say your daughter or anyone else's? That's a great question. Wow. I think I can answer it the same way. Because if I look at myself, you said, would it have saved me? I was not a great teenager. So I was abusing alcohol and drugs and I was violent. Yep. So I think it comes back to the same answer I said before is that would I have applied the knowledge if I read it? I don't know. So I don't know if I would have. If I had have met you back then when you were a teenager and you were on a sort of different path, we'll say. Yeah. And I had have applied empathy to your circumstances and choices would that have helped you back then yeah i had a couple circumstances i had a couple of yeah. friends i had one neville miller he applied so much empathy and time with me he took me under his wing he taught me so many things man was a literal genius and he just taught me things that had nothing to do with life but just how to grow roses how to make yeah. essential oils, how to <laughs> play a piano, how to do math. The guy was amazing. He, he taught me, he's the one who taught me to play chess. It didn't at that moment. Yes. Okay. So at that moment, it kept me out of trouble. He kept me focused on something more positive. And now as an adult, I reflect on that and think about, man, he may have saved my life at that time. Now at that moment, it didn't adjust everything about me. It didn't make me less violent and more empathetic, you know, for like right away. Yeah, But it gave me a life experience that I think I wouldn't trade in for anything. I wouldn't trade it in. I think that's very nicely said. And I don't want to say anything else. I don't want to (laughs) detract much from that. I think that's really nice. So then in summation, would you say that it is equally as nice to be the recipient of empathy as it is to feel it? And how do you know that you are Mm. receiving empathy and not just good nature? Or is there a difference? Great questions. Okay, so there's a principle that Mm -hmm. says there's more happiness in giving than in receiving. Science, recently, there was a study I was just reading has proven that. Okay. And also Dr. Zach did, in his book, The Moral Molecule, he did a study on the release of oxytocin when people give others, when they trust them enough to give up of money or things like that. Mm -hmm. So I think there is more of a reward psychologically for when we give empathy. Mm-hmm. And when we receive it, okay, there's more of a reward for us, not for the person, right? So yeah. for us, when we give it, our brain rewards us and we feel better about ourselves. And it gives us a moment where we can feel good about the thing we just did. You know, with that said, now, how do you know if you're getting empathy or not? I think that most people can understand the difference between false comfort and mm-hmm. real comfort. You know, and I think that when someone really empathizes, they try their hardest to think about the words they're using. Yeah. You know, so like if you had a family member that just died and I came to you and I said, you know, Max, I know how you feel. That's not a very empathetic statement. No, that's not. even So, you know, even if like, let's say it was your grandma and my grandma died just because my grandma died and your grandma doesn't mean I understand how you feel. Right. We're two different people with different emotional makeups, with two different relationships. So. If I'm an empathetic person, I think about my words before I say them. And I don't go to you and say, you know, I know how you feel. I lost my grandma too. 
empathy may make me handle that differently. I think you're right. And the question I'd like to ask you is, so then empathy is dualistic in the way that it can be taught. You can be taught empathy then, if I'm hearing you correctly, by both receiving it and by watching people give it. So Amaya watching you yes. become empathetic to someone at the side of the road is equally as impactful as you showing Amaya empathy one-on-one, yes. you to her. I think that one without the other is damaging, right? So if Amaya only saw me be empathetic with her, but with Mm -hmm. everybody else, I was a complete jerk. Yeah. She may then internalize that, let's say as a very young toddler or something and think she's the Mm -hmm. only one who deserves my empathy. Yeah. Right. So that may make her not an empathetic person. It may make her very selfish, right? It may make her very like feel privileged almost. So if she sees me, treating her good and then treating her friends good and then treating other people good and treating strangers good, then she goes, oh, wow, this is the way we're supposed to be. So I think it's a dual lesson that they go hand in hand and if one without the other is is not helpful. Nicely said. I think we've covered quite a lot and we've talked about empathy to a sort of a large degree in this, but I I don't want to think that that strays too far away from how it's covered in the book. No, I'm I'm excited, actually, that this was a good conversation, and hopefully we'll get people uh, excited about reading it. So I promise, last question, what is it exactly, and I know we've touched on empathy, what exactly is it you want people to walk away with after they've read this book? Yeah, I want them to walk away with the understanding that, you know, we live in a world right now, everything's digital, and Mm -hmm. we've kind of lost some of our ability to communicate in a way that is healthy for each other. We debate stupid things on the internet. The social media has empowered people to say the most horrible things to other humans that most of us would never say in person. We would never say these things face to face, but the anonymity of the internet has made it so we can threaten people. We could be sexist. We could be prejudiced. We could be all sorts of horrible things with empowerment, and then find groups that support us in these things. And my hope is that if people read this and they apply some of this, is that we can learn there's a better way to communicate. And that if we communicate in that way, the effect that it can have on us, our families, and our immediate circles could be life-altering. I don't want the hope to be that this book is here to change the world. Let's change my family. You change your family. And if everyone that reads it focuses on changing their family, then every family makes up a community. And if we can change communities, then maybe we can make adjustments in how we communicate. So my hope is, is that people that read it will learn how to communicate better. And, you know, look, I wrote this stuff. I practice this stuff, but I fail at it all the time. So, you know, one of the things I want people to realize, too, is that it's not like you're going to read this and you're never going to mess up again. It's going to happen. Emotions are going to hijack you. You're going to mess up. But pick yourself back up. Try. Do, keep at this. None of us are perfect. But being an empathetic, compassionate, emotional communicator, we can make a change. And we can, we can win friends and influence people and leave everyone better off for having met us. Perfect. Thank you. That was nicely said. Look at you. You didn't want to do this interview. Wow. <laughs> but, well... First of all, yes, no, that was lovely. And second of all, even though (laughs) this is your podcast, you do not escape the what's your favorite book? What book should we read Ah. question? And I hope you are prepared for it. Yes, yeah. So, you know, I'm reading a couple books right now. Mm -hmm. None of them will probably be really great for this podcast, but (laughs) (laughs) I'm reading a book by Robert Hare called Without Conscience. It's about psychopaths and understanding the psychopathic mind. Joan Navarro turned me on to that. I'm reading this book called Anti-Fragile. Ah, good book. Yeah, it is a great book. And it makes your mind work. Yes, it does. In a way, (laughs) like I not have thought this deeply about things in a long time. And it's like hurting a little bit. (laughs) And then the book that I'm looking at it that is always on my desk which I'm not reading, but it's always on my desk, is Joe Navarro's The uh, Dictionary yes. of Body Language. I see you look at that quite often, actually, oh, in the ends. Yeah. It's always open. I make notes in it. This is like a reference Bible for me. It's yes. like, uh, you know, I'm watching something or at a team meeting and I'll see someone do something and I'll just flip to the page and be like, okay, what do I need to know about this here? 
I mean, honestly, the one book that will never leave my desk will be this book. This one. Yeah. It's just, it's a reference book and I love this thing. So those are the three I'm focusing on right now. Good stuff. Well, Max, yeah. thank you. You did not a great job at this. I was nervous, <laughs> but not because of the interview. I just hate self-promotion, but you did a great job on this and I really mm -hmm. appreciate the great questions. Not at all. Your book is oh. on January 5th. January 5th. You January. can find it on Amazon or humanhackingbook.com. Yep. Maxi on Twitter is Maxi Reynolds. You can follow her. Yeah. I am Human Hacker. Our corporate is SOC Engineer Inc. And everything to do with SE Village is SE Village on Twitter, which you can find that at humanhackingconference.com. We just released that our conference has a virtual component, which is much safer now due to COVID. Uh, most of our classes are going to be taught virtually. So check that out at humanhackingconference.com. Social-engineer.org is where the newsletter, podcast, and all the other fun stuff is. And social-engineer.com is our corporate site. Please check out innocentlivesfoundation.org for the work we're doing there. And uh, give a shout out to Clutch. They're our music for the podcast and happen to be the best rock and roll band on the planet Earth. So until That's next month. Yep. Don't forget, guys, this is a series, the Human Hacker series. And in a couple of weeks, we'll be releasing our security awareness series of a brand new podcast yes it's gonna be fun exciting. Oh, wait, Until, in, that's all right don't, don't well you're involved that. in the human hacking series I should be able to <laughs> you are in my heart now, until next month the empathy until next month bye see ya